Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mark Kukuzela. Well, gosh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I'm at the rough time of day. You know, everyone's a little bit sleepy, traveling in from all over the world, and I've had wonderful conversations here already this week. I come from West Virginia. I'm at what I uh, call the little hospital that could. It's a small 24-bed critical access hospital in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. We're part of West Virginia University, which is a large healthcare system and kind of a large mothership in Morgantown, West Virginia. I'm also a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserves, 29 years the Air Force. Like many of you, my thoughts and prayers this week are with your neighbors 100 miles to the east in Houston, Texas. So my thoughts go out to them this week. Um, we're having this event here today, so let's share knowledge and love with each other, and, but have our thoughts with the people really in need. So I'm going to fly through a little bit of the basic science I try to explain to patients simply today, a little of my backstory, what a healing community is, which is really a lot of why we're all here today, and then kind of that top down and bottom up merging in the middle to make change. And we know that change doesn't happen fast in medicine, so this is not a, a quick process. So in, in brief, I have a hospital now that allows me to use a low carbohydrate diet that's been signed off by the top levels of our hospital as legitimate treatment for anyone with insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. So this is an option we can give patients and are now are actively giving patients that they can choose. Yeah, that makes sense to me, but that was about six years of work to get a 24-bed hospital to legitimize this. But that's a start, you know, you're like, it's like moving the rock, you know, to move a big rock is very difficult, but to move little rocks like mine, that's how it all starts. You know, so we all know the costs of diabetes are staggering, and my state cannot afford diabetes. More money spent in West Virginia on diabetes care than education, roads, you know, all the essential things we need in my community. We know that obesity is undefeated. Diabetes, diabetes is undefeated. They're not going away. Rates may be leveling off, going up, depending on what you read, but they're not reversing. Um, diabetes follows obesity. This is CDC data, and this shouldn't shock anybody. The more obesity, the more diabetes in children. It's not called adult diabetes anymore, which when I was in medical school, I'm 50 now, it was called adult diabetes, but now it's just called type 2 because now we're seeing four-year-olds with this problem. Um, my friend John from Mississippi, uh, we kind of fight this out for the worst health state. Um, you could depend on what map you bring up. This is shocking. So if you have a moment later tonight, maybe you have a video that's similar in your own city. If you just put into YouTube, Charleston, West Virginia, 1981 and 1982, you see this about a 10 minute video of someone just driving around the streets. And when you step back and look at that, you're like, how did they edit out all the obese people? There aren't any. So this is really, you know, about 50 years, less than 50 years, and now you go walk around Charleston, West Virginia, and you might as well have gone to the moon. It's a totally different place. Uh, my friend Dr. Phil Maffetone really has set this paradigm, and, and this morning when we talked about TOFI, it's really this overfat we're worried about, overfat in the wrong places, the wrong kind of fat in the wrong places. Now, this is not the minority in the world. This is the majority. You know, and there's a, a paper published on this also. Uh, ben Bickman's going to talk about this on Saturday or Sunday, I believe. But all fat is not bad. So we have this healthy brown subcutaneous fat. And then we have that bad visceral fat. And I'll explain this to patients. You know, pretty simply, you've got metabolically active fat. So let's not just use fat as an all negative thing. I'm talking about fat on our bodies. Um, diabetes, and this is still in the 2017 uh, standards of care. It's a chronic, complex illness, continual medical care for life. And this is what we need to debunk and show people that there is an alternative. You know, whether we use remission, reversal, let me go back here. So this is a slide. So if you go to the Kaiser's uh, data, 120,000 patients, the only, it's rare unless you do bariatric surgery to reduce or re put uh, diabetes into remission. Your chances of dying during this cohort study was greater than your chances of any remission of your diabetes. Um, have any of you all been to this page yet? It's the CDC AMA and uh, ADA pre-diabetes page. It's a public page. Do I have pre-diabetes? And you click on to the dietary advice, and this is what you read. Reduce fat, reduce fat grams, count fat grams, and reduce calories. There's not a single line in that on an option to reduce carbohydrates. So you can go to that site. Um, 
the Pure study just came out, and the AMA, I'm wondering what they're going to do, whether they're going to have to backpedal, because this is from AMA News yesterday. The Pure study just came out. And I'm going to share a Dropbox folder with you all at the end of this presentation that you could jot down, which will have all of these articles you can download for later, plus all the patient resources I talk about, a number of provider tools also. Many of you all are here because you've probably had this happen in your life. Two roads diverted. Uh, 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 you hit a fork in the road, two roads diverged, and you took the one less taken. And that has made all the difference. That's Robert Frost. So this is what I'll walk into the room with with a patient. I'll bring in this little graphic. I love it. It was from Reader's Digest. Most people who see me in the hospital, they've had a heart attack. They, some kind of medical crisis, heart failure, diabetic ulcer, what have you, you know, CHF. And I'll say, look, you're here. You're at a fork in the road. Now, you can go this route standard route and become a medical patient for life, lots of drugs, lots of meds, injections, or there is this path that you can get healthy again. Do you want to know about that path? And I'd probably say 95% of the times it's like, yeah, doc, tell me about that path. Maybe 5% they really don't want to know, and then it's up to me to figure out what the elephant in the room is, because maybe they have depression, financial stress, substance abuse, something else is going on in their life that they really honestly don't want to be healthy. But the majority want to be healthy and they want to know that path. Now I'm a family doc, you know, and where the experts disagree, the ignorant are free to choose. I'm a GP, you know, so who in this room is an expert on anything? I'm not, <laughs> you know, so that's where we're open to possibilities if, you know, we kind of you know, absolve everything to expert opinion or eminence-based therapy, you know, that's where we go down paths and we figure out 20 or 30 years later maybe we were wrong. I share this with patients too. In the military, I'm a flight doc, and we do military trauma care. It's controlling medication. Come into the hospital, you're bleeding, there's protocols, stop the bleeding. If that's me, I want to be in a military hospital. I don't want any decisions in the thing. Just, just do what you got to do to save my life. But in medical school, this is how most medical training happens in substitutive model. I have a headache, take a pill. Diabetes, take a pill. Blood pressure, take a pill. What have you, take a pill. But we all know here today that there's this catalytic model, that the body has the capacity to restore and heal itself. I share this with patients, too. We cannot change what we are not aware of, but once we are aware, we cannot help but change. This is a good book here to just talk about that whole principle. It's called Disrupt You. How many in the room here have disrupted themselves in some way, and that's led to you to be here? Yeah, this is kind of my first disruptive technology in my life. I'm a runner. I ran all through high school, college, wrecked my body like a lot of runners out there. Brad Kearns is in the audience somewhere. He did the same thing. Had operations in my feet, you know, and doctors said not to run. But I enjoyed running just for that just relaxation and peace of mind. And uh, so I went out and needed to figure out running. So I started running barefoot, you know, about the year 2000. And this is with Chris McDougall, who really disrupted it all by writing Born to Run. You know, and that's made all the difference. I haven't had a running injury knock on wood since that surgery, which was about 17 years ago. You know, my, this is my genes. And many of you all, Kukazella Bakery, that's real outside Newark Airport. Here's my father reading New Atkins for a new, new you. And I, yeah, he's from, you know, he's Wilmington, Philly. You know, he eats the bread and the pretzels, puts the weight on, and then I say, Dad, we've got to get you back on it. He'll lose 20 pounds, gain it, lose it. But that's the way he is. He's still alive, God bless his soul. And he had two bypass operations, the last one being almost 40 years ago. So he's beaten the odds. He's got rid of a lot of stress in his life, too, which is probably me leaving the house. So can you be fit and not healthy? This is really, really important, because this is me in 2006, before I knew anything about nutrition. You know, I was pretty fit, was able to win races, but I was developing pre-diabetes. About the year 2010, I started to understand this stuff when the military assigned me to a project to look at why people were failing fitness tests. And I quickly realized there was something about obesity. And then I got into the rabbit hole of nutrition. Um, so pre-2010, pre-diabetes, I'd wake up every morning at 2 in the morning to eat more carbohydrates. I was insulin resistant. My body couldn't burn fat to, for you know, I couldn't go more than four hours without putting food into my body, but I wasn't becoming obese, but becoming sick. You know, now 2017, I, I'm not as fit, you know, I'm 50 years old, but everything is healthy. Those are my lab markers, my A1C's improved. 
Ivers here, my CAC score is zero. Even did one of those wonky telomere tests, you know, so I come out at 35. That's an interesting test. Be careful what you ask for. I'll jump into the lab every year. Peter Defty's following me here, so he'll talk about fat burning for the endurance athlete. My body can burn about two grams of fat a minute, but that's a long process to get there. But that's when you're just, you're happy, you're not tired at all, you don't need a power gel or anything. You can just run until your legs give out. But the military doesn't understand this yet either because um, I'm going to share this with you guys on the, in the Dropbox. But high performance research center out of the military tells all military soldiers to eat carbohydrates. All carbohydrates. But sir, we have a problem. If any of you all follow the news, now we're becoming an obese military, you know, following advice. But the guys who know what to do, so this is, I was given a running workshop. These are the special ops guys. They're called combat controllers, PJ. So these are the guys who get dropped out of planes, go find a target, and get the hell out of there and get their lives saved by a pickup helicopter somewhere. So they may not have a meal for four or five days. You know, what they're going to survive on is on their backpack. And these guys are all like paleo warriors because they don't ask the experts. They ask their cadre, you know, the guys survive 30 missions. What do you eat? Well, I don't. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, tell me about that. Uh, Jeff Volek's doing some interesting work with this, this group. I'm in, uh, curious about what he has to say and what he's going to find out. I've learned from everybody. Dr. Noakes uh, did a course with him a few years back, and I didn't know he was into this nutrition thing. And then when he shared his story, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm not crazy. Because <laughs> when Dr. Noakes was talking about it, I'm like, he's the guy. You know, in Breckenridge this year, all these people from all over the world learning their stories. The UK is way ahead of the States, and I love the PHC. You know, this is their shirt, keep calm and eat real food. I think this summarizes a lot. It's Dr. David Unwin, Nutrition Coalition. So we're trying to affect policy in DC to change the dietary guidelines. Hopefully the PURE study will help us do that. Couple slides which I'll draw out on napkins for patients. This is the insulin resistance spectrum. Almost everyone I see at one point in their life they were insulin sensitive, like when they were in high school and then they got all these diseases. So you just walk them through it, it's pretty simple. They answer the questions for you. Not gonna explain this slide, but everyone should read Dr. Gerald Raven. He's the godfather of insulin resistance, so read his work. He explained it all. We talked about the craft patterns. I'll draw out for the patient kind of where they are based on their postprandial glucoses. You know, because we'll, in the hospital, check their sugar one and two hours after a meal. I don't have a, a live insulin level then, but we can extrapolate some of these things. But I'll tell patients this, because this is true, and this is Joseph Kraft. Those with cardiovascular disease not identified with diabetes are simply undiagnosed. They're the same thing. So when we have the cardiovascular patients, they've got the diabetes. They just don't know it yet. And then the diabetic patients, they've got the cardiovascular disease. They just haven't had the heart attack yet. So they need to understand these are the same things. Ben's going to give a talk on Sunday. But yeah, throw a dart at the most common chronic illnesses, and you'll find insulin resistance at the root. Nobody dies of insulin resistance. They, they die. It's the vehicle that gets them there. Now, when we look at the healthy plate, so I have two plates I go around with the hospital. You know, so we have the standard healthy plate for a well person, and then we have this for an insulin resistance, which just gives the big red X over that whole quarter, which is grains and bread and pasta. But the majority of patients are insulin resistant. That's why it can't be this one size fits all. And I would, uh, in the hospital, I would probably say it's 90% are insulin resistant. That's why they're in the hospital. The only one's not insulin resistant in my hospital, some of the mothers delivering babies, not all of them, some of the infants, some inf infants are actually insulin resistant now, and maybe an occasional kid who needs an appendicitis operation. But the rest are there for some complication of insulin resistance. This is the paradigm we're trying to break is, okay, more treatment, they're getting better, but no more treatment, they're getting worse. And we know that the multiple trials showing if you give more medications for diabetes, you will get sicker and die sooner because it's rotting your bodies inside and out. One of the early hospital trials, which I like, which just helped me walk into a room and say, I'm not doing anything that hasn't been done, was a study by Bowdoin. And this was a 14-day 
post-discharge study showing insulin levels and glucose levels, plus multiple markers of metabolic syndrome were being turned upside down in just 14 days after a hospital intervention of low carbohydrate. So I went to University of Virginia, so I like this quote. I hold it that a little rebellion every now and then is a good thing, other than what happened about two weeks ago in Charlottesville. So that makes me sad. I went there for college and medical school, and that was a disgrace to my college and my town. I walk into a room and also tell patients this. Imagine a color you've never seen before, because being healthy and having energy, if you've had diabetes, they don't even know what it is. They're so sick. Healing community, what is a healing community? This can't happen in isolation in a doctor's office because it's everything out there, the support systems. You know, like-minded people. Melanie's gonna follow me here today. This is a picture of one of our low-carb support meetings in West Virginia. Social context, it's a process, it's not an event. So two years ago, I found this picture. So I was doing this in a hospital, but the movement really wasn't growing to the point that we could spread this outside of the hospital. So I met Melanie, and then this was one of my hospital patients, Terry. He needs the suspenders there because his pants were falling down. And we talked about how to start a revolution in West Virginia, trying to help people learn how to eat. You know, and Melanie with Jimmy there, you know, she'll share her story. You know, it's in the papers. You know, we, uh, in these meetings, you know, we have a chef. There's Chef Scott. He's reversed his metabolic syndrome. We'll share recipes, but it's more just sharing joys, stories, stories, community of healing. You know, if you don't get support at home, come to a meeting. Here's some of our local champions who are helping teach. You know, clinic patient Lance, he goes to our clinic. Julie's here in the audience, you know, helping her church. So we need to jump as folks from my position, physicians, because physicians tend to be laggards in how we adopt new change. If you're an engineer, you tend to be more of an early adopter, but this is just the way medical change happens. It's the way it is. So we need to cross that change, that chasm from innovator early adopter to early majority, and that's what we're trying to do. Getting people to take the blue pill, you know, so the blue pill, I'm sorry, don't take the blue, take the red pill, and uh, you'll see where the rabbit hole goes. This is from the matrix. So we want to get patients and even hospitals to consider just going down this red pill pathway. This little book here we have up on the med surge and the ICU. So if a patient's sitting there and they're like, well, what do I eat on this? We can actually show them a recipe book and they're like, wow, that looks good. Bacon, eggs, vegetables, wow, that looks really good. And then they're not all like, well, tell me more about that doc. And we go in and we you know, give them some websites where they're on their phone. Here's some hospital patients. This is Terry. You know, he, was in, he was not on the OB ward in that picture. That's metabolic syndrome at its worst. You know, this uh, Steve Williams, all my meds are in the trash. This is a year later, walking 20,000 steps. You know, Anita Nestor, and these folks have given permission to share their stories. She has one of the worst cases of lymphedema, can't, is really immobile, is in and out of the hospital for that, but now she has hope that she can get better again. One of my hospital patients came back for a stress test after discharge. Doc, I don't have diabetes anymore. And it's like, yay, now she's got to stay on it. You know, here's an, this guy's uh, five kids, over 100 units of insulin gone, 70 pounds gone. He can play with his kids again. They had a Twitter contest. This is one of our hospital patients. His A1C went from 23 to 5. 23 to 5. I'm not making that up. And he goes down to what we call the community ministries now, which is our local food bank, and is trying to educate low-income people. But he's the story. You know, he's also lost about 80 pounds. And this is the chart. We don't need to belabor that. I kind of think this is true, and I try to teach this. I, I do think this is true. I teach this to medical students. You know, we have this model. You know, the doctor will see you now in the white coat, all that gobbledygook. But it's really the patient will see you now because everything I've learned in my life, I've learned from my patients. So this gentleman had a heart attack three weeks ago, was in our hospital. We had to ship him out. You know, we don't do cardiac catheterizations or any of the fancy stuff. But we did have a short conversation. I said, I'll help you when you leave. So he's, uh, here's a couple things from his story. This is three weeks. His sugar was 500 when he came into the ER with his heart attack. He couldn't walk without knee pain. Now, the after picture there, there you know, he looks pretty close. He's 28 pounds down. Shorts hang on him. No knee braces. His pain is gone. He's on no diabetes meds. None. 
you know, I think he might benefit from a little metformin, but he wanted all in. He's like, I just want to get rid of the meds. Dad's complaint this past week was he had too much energy to nap. But this is the power, this is community, the powerful thing. Mom's diabetes has also improved. She is off all diabetic meds. Um, so yeah, they bring it home to them. Here's another patient. I'm just going to highlight a few things because this is a note that Lonnie wrote. This guy has lost 60 pounds in three weeks. He was so bloated from the insulin. He was on over 200 units of insulin a day. Again, another hospital patient. Went home and did this. He's down to some long-acting lantus in the morning, feeling good. He's going to kind of slowly come off of that. But yeah, so learning to use foods that do not cause issues with the way my body processes food. You know, so he's learning, and he's going to go out and educate patients. What works for one person will not always work for another. He's focusing on physical activity, mental health, stress. But yeah, so he believes he can get better now. He really didn't believe he could get better. So a little of kind of what's happening in my whole system now, because we started this in the hospital, thanks to Melanie, the community's doing this. People come into my clinic now, we have a clinic with our residency, the medical students, and the clinic is offering this as an option now. So here's Victor, uh, A1C is 17 to 6 in four months. That's not a medication change, that's off of medications. So that's powerful, 70 pounds down. I saw him at one of my daughter's uh, sports events this week, and he looks good, he has energy, you know, so yeah, he knows it's not over. Medical residents, so this is one of our chief residents. And she was giving a lunch and learn at our clinic, you know, with all of the low carb food. And she's one of our biggest champions within the residency to add this to residency curriculum. Her name's Dr. Humerick. Four years ago, we put in a grant to West Virginia University School of Medicine. They were looking for these seed grants to do innovative things in medical curriculum. So we wrote, a, myself and our dean, we wrote this um, curriculum called Med Chefs, where we take medical students into the kitchen. So this is one of the sessions. And the textbook, our first year, and still is, they just kind of recycle it back. It was Fat Chance just came out. Dr. Robert Lustig partnered with us on this grant. So they're kind of learning metabolic syndrome, low carb, who it's for, who it's not for, in the context of learning how to cook. We made this last week, keto bread. And this is me. Look at it. This is in a medical school. Seven eggs, two tablespoons coconut oil, half a cup of butter, all going in and cooking it. And we're, and we're not telling the students, well, this is going to give you a heart attack. No, no, it's like this is for this type of diet. But I'm beware of this. And two weeks ago, they asked me to distribute this book to the medical students. It was given out free. This book is being given out free to medical students around the country kind of covertly, because what the PCRM, the group is called Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, they go to the dean's offices and say we have an $80 value book that we want to give you for free to distribute to the medical students. And it just ends up in the medical students' hands. That should not happen. Here is just one line out of here. Okay, for, here are the orders for cardiovascular disease. Vegetarian diet, non-dairy, low-fat, nutritional consultation to advise patient regarding the above diet and arrange follow-up. They quote the Mediterranean diet as their evidence for this, but fail to quote that it was the higher-fat version of the Mediterranean diet in PrediMed that was effective. So this is not medical information, but it's happening. If you go to their site and there's a resource tab for students, and you read that, you'll be like, oh my gosh, how does this stop? But no one vets the nutrition information in medical schools. It just flies into their hands. Top down change, Clay Marsh, he's our captain of the ship, president of the Health Sciences Center at WVU, happens to be a colleague of Jeff Follett and Gary Taubes. He brought Gary Taubes to a statewide conference. And Gary just told what he learned from 20 years of observing and writing about this. And I think everyone in this audience has heard Gary Taubes. The disruptive orthopedist. This is Brad Wright, another former Air Force doctor, said to me the other day, you know, I really enjoy now helping people get healthy and not operating so much. And he operated on Melanie. Yeah, so here's uh, my local dean, Casey Now. This is a, a, 
um, we're opening the Center for Metabolic Health. So I've been given the title of Low Carbohydrate Nutrition Director within a university. And this is going to be hanging on our, our wall. That's eggs. That is really eggs. So, yeah, so it's happening. It's cool. Bottom-up change. So this is my hospital. Here's Nancy, Environmental Services. She cleans the floors, 100 pounds down, 20,000 steps a day. Here's some of our sample menus. That's a breakfast. This is kind of one of the lunch trays. I have a folder of all the sample menus. Here's one, you know, so look what you can get for dinner. Hamburger on a bed of lettuce, stewed tomato, spinach, salad, pork chop for lunch, baked cod. So this is our kitchen. This is what, when that order goes to the kitchen, this is what they see. I do all the stress tests in the hospital, and these are my ladies, and they distribute out all the food lists and all the patient handouts that I have in this little folder here, because that's where we catch people too, is the stress lab. Um, got about four, maybe three more minutes here. The nursing staff, this is Amanda. She's lost 100 pounds. She's in there teaching. Cindy, another nurse, she brought this home to her husband, A1C 13 to now six. Also has lost like 40 or 50 pounds. Nurse leadership, so this is great. You need to find your partners. So our leadership in the nursing side has brought it to the administration saying we need to formalize this. Now we have computers that can show videos. And we don't have to like, it. in the past, what I'd do before this was legit, I'd pull out the patient's iPhone, I'd hit it and say, Google search skinny and obesity, Robert Lustig or something. And the video would come up and I'd hand it back to them and they'd watch it. But now we can actually do this above the table legit. You know, we do lunch and learns. This was one we did a couple weeks ago. You know, teaching staff, teaching anyone who wants to come. Here are a couple really amazing stories. So Dara's down in the kitchen, two former college football players. This is Dim, he's off all diabetic medications now. About six weeks ago, he had a creatinine of seven, was shipped out of our hospital because he was on early stage and uh, renal failure and we thought he would need dialysis. But now he's back, his diabetes is gone, and he's lost about 50 pounds. But these two guys help each other because they're both former college football players. There's Melanie, she's gonna share her story, one of her hospital approved meals there. We double SNAP at our farmer markets too, so this was a grant we wrote to the USDA. So SNAP is food stamps, so they can come to our farmer markets and they swipe their benefit card and 20 bucks becomes 40 bucks. Powerful program, we have to figure out how to scale that up. Concept of minimally disruptive medicine. So that's where the burden of illness has its counterpart in the burden of treatment. So I'm just gonna fly through this. This is our 55-year-old diabetic patient you know, and this is all the things that we're asking them to do. Take pills, more pills, more appointments, all this stuff. They've got three kids. You know, how do they do all that? They can't. It's too complex. So we want to simplify it. What if we applied the same thinking to diabetes as we did to polio? We would just have a world of iron lungs now. We have to go for the root cause. Summary slide. And that is it. But this, if you want to write down this tiny earl, this is a Dropbox link that'll have folders of resources or email me and I'll send it to you. We have two minutes for questions. I'm sorry I ran through a lot of that, but I'm writing my email down and if you're in a hospital, I wanna help you break down some of those barriers because this really was about six years of gentle disruption. We call it kind of mindful disruption. You don't go in and get angry. Patients started sharing stories, nurses, yeah, and it just kind of built that way. So, but now I think you could press it through quicker than six years. Questions? I think you, I think you actually might have just answered part of my question, but I was at uh, Children's Hospital in Denver with a friend whose 10 year old has a brain tumor and I was actually bringing her food because she does ketogenics and they did have a ketogenics menu there, but on the ketogenics menu it had orange juice, apple juice, very yeah, little fat, it, it was all protein. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to do something, say something, I don't know yes. where they get their information from. This is what you have to do. So I spend time in the kitchen with the kitchen staff because the, the kitchen staff are like part of your team and it's amazing when you go down, when they do a nice meal and you go down and thank like Sodaro, you're like, dude, that was amazing. You've made perfect lunch, you know, it's right on the money. So you have to go down into the kitchen 
because these folks have no training. They're the lowest paid employees in the hospital. But they, when you go down in there and you acknowledge, man, what you're doing is like more important than the interventional cardiologist. Right. So go down and make those relationships because it's not that they don't care. They just don't know that they, they don't know. But if you go down and show them what a proper ketogenic diet is with what they have in the kitchen there, which is the eggs and, you know, just not the juice, right. you, just, you, you construct the, the plate for them and give them some menu. So pull up my little sample menu folders because all you'd have to do is just hand them that and that's it. I mean, it'd be close, pretty close to ketogenic. There might be some fruit on there, but maybe just wipe off the fruit if you really want ketogenic. All right, thank you. You, I was out of time the last time. I just really quickly want to ask this question. Um, so my husband's diabetic. He's not ketogenic. He's very stubborn. His blood sugars are out of control. Um, insulin dependent, you know, the whole shebang. His doctor tells him that his pancreas is shot. So is it shot? Or it, you don't know. Will, will something like this... It's a great you know, question. So on the, one of the handouts I have is called a DM remission pathway. So I take people down to about 25-ish of Lantus long-acting long acting in the morning, the people that have been on super high doses, kind of let them reset there. And then if they start to get low, then you start peeling off the Lantus, because their body will tell, and I think the pancreas can recover, but I don't want to like drop all the insulin and stress their pancreas. I want to help fix their metabolism, give them a basal, and then kind of, it'll, the patient will decide because they're, either they're going to respond when you start weaning the lantus down or they're going to not respond. But don't rush people off long-acting lantus who are so far down the road that they might have that late beta cell failure, which is not uncommon in these long-standing diabetics who are like 70, 80 years old. And if they have a skinny body habitus, they're probably late-stage beta cell failure because they have absolute insulin deficiency. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're up for time. I'll hang out over here if anyone has anything specific about hospital stuff. Be glad to chat with you.